All right. So hopefully, well, put this one more time. I put a link to a document in the chat. Um, it's just a Google Doc. I figure we could um, use it to take group notes there. Um, it kind of has the agenda that I've sort of planned to go through this morning. Well, it's morning for me. I don't know about everybody else, but <laughs> so welcome everybody to the material sample task group uh, working session. And uh, what I want to do first this morning is kind of catch everybody up on what we've done over the last year, which maybe doesn't seem like a whole ton of stuff, but um, it did take a lot of work. So I am going to share my screen and I'm just basically going to share this document. Uh, I thought about re rehashing my slides, but um, no sense in doing that. So um, on this this agenda, the first links at the top are sort of our working documents for the task group that um, things that we're working on right now and um, things that we're hoping to propose soon, I think. Um, and so what we've done so far is we spent a lot of time talking about what a material sample is and how material sample relates to living specimen, fossil specimen, preserved specimen, and organism. And um, after a lot of philosophical discussions and thinking about these things, we came to a couple of conclusions. Um, one is that uh, an organism may be a material sample, but a material sample isn't necessarily an organism, um, and that those two things are separate and distinct. And then that having essentially four classes for what we consider to be the same thing seemed a, a little excessive. So we re have uh, come up with a better, we think, definition for material sample. And in the end, we'll probably propose deprecation of living, preserved, and fossil specimen. Um, I know we could probably have a day long discussion about that, but um, that's where we are with the material sample definition right now. Uh, next up, we knew and know that we're going to need identifiers for these things. So we uh, came up with a good definition for material sample ID. So those are the two things we've actually accomplished. And the next step was, well, we're going to have to describe this material. And we know we're going to need ways for people to coarsely parse things in the way they use fossil living and preserved specimen right now. Um, and so we started thinking about material sample type. And this is sort of where we are and have been for several months um, thinking about how would we describe these physical objects. And uh, not too long into this discussion, we realized that having a single term material sample type was probably going to be overloaded um, because we were looking at um, processes that got you the sample, what the sample was made of, what the sample represented. Um, it was all getting mashed into one term and it just seemed overworked. So um, luckily on our task group, we have somebody who works with Internet of Samples and he brought us uh, their scheme that they're working on right now. And we started taking a look at it. So this is moving into what we're working on, uh, material sample type, right? And we've been throwing around the Internet of Samples terms, these three terms you see here, material sample type, sampled feature, and material type as potential terms um, that, that would be properties of the material sample class. And you can see the definitions that uh, iSamples has for these three terms. And um, farther up in the sheet, there's our brainstorming uh, 
Google Sheet where we've been playing around with these three terms and sort of looking at, okay, if I had something in my collection and I use these three terms, all of which have controlled vocabularies, if I use those vocabularies to try to describe my sample, uh, does it work for me as um, a data provider to be able to describe this thing well? And would it work for potential users to be able to find my object amongst all other objects in, in say, a big aggregation like GBIF? Um, and I feel like our testing of this to some degree has stalled. So, you know, a few of us in the task group have taken a stab at this and maybe said, oh, yeah, we think this works. But in general, I have felt like we haven't cast our net broadly enough to be able to say this is a great thing these terms would be great in darwin core let's approach the internet of samples people and just bring this stuff in so i created this little google form right here um where i basically ask whoever's filling out the form to tell me what you have and then use these three terms and their vocabularies to describe it. Um, and then give me some feedback on how you think that works. So one thing I would appreciate from everybody who's at this meeting today is um, that you take this form and maybe take the objects that you work with or want to work with um, and think about how these three terms and their vocabularies would work to describe that well. Um, the next thing that has popped into my radar just in the last week is Latimer Core. And Latimer Core is, uh, is the proposal for describing collections, right? The sort of Darwin Core of collections description. And um, I've been aware of this on the periphery, but just recently I spent some time perusing their uh, draft documents because there it's not um, an actual standard yet. But um, what I found when I started looking at it is that they have proposed quite a few terms that seem not only appropriate for describing a collection as a whole, but individual pieces of that collection. And so uh, under this Latimer core uh, dot here, I've got the terms and their definitions and then notes and examples for these things, um, because I think this is something that the task group needs to look at closely um, before we move into just, oh, we're going to accept eye samples or how eye samples might fit into some of these terms. And uh, Yuda is the one who's straddling these two task groups and, and really got me to look at this in greater detail. So uh, I don't want to delve too deeply into that right now. Maybe we can do that as we continue talking. But um, I do see that there's a few people here who aren't on the task group or have um, only um, kind of been on the fringes. And so what I would like to do is have a discussion about um, potentially the things we've done um, and if everybody thinks those are good, bad, or indifferent, and um, where we're headed with the material sample type discussion. So uh, I guess first off, does anybody have any comments or questions about our definition of material sample? Nothing for a material sample ID? 
so what am I going to have to do to get anybody to talk here today? <laughs> I would offer donuts or something, but I can't really do that. So maybe I can kick this off. Um, so um, I tried to um, to to be part of the task group. It didn't. It didn't always. I didn't always succeed. Um, but um, it is a topic that is of great interest to um, to us here in Berlin and um, in various contexts. And so to answer your question, so the current um, the current proposal for the material sample definition um, that we worked on together is a physical object that represents a physical entity of interest in whole or part. And um, um uh, I think I wrote this earlier in in one of the github based discussions that we had in the task group. Um, I think in general, this is um, I can work with this definition. what um what we want to capture, I think, with material sample is the multitude of different objects that come into existence and um, um maybe um maybe don't exist for too long um, in the course of the history that a collection object has from the first um from from the first intervention that um humans have with um the the um, original item uh collected in nature observed in nature to that um to that uh preserved item that is um, intended to be stored in a collection for uh, maybe an indefinite amount of time and 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 um i think or, or at least this is my understanding that um the the class material sample is intended to um to encompass all the different objects that may be lined up along that path and and also of course into the future when there are additional derivatives of a, a preserved specimen in a collection think of tissue samples think think of extracts that are being taken yeah. and um so i think this definition basically does the job um, it includes all those objects and um, it hopefully doesn't include too much um, too much of the other stuff that that is that it is not intended for. One point of interest, I think, is to further explicate what we mean or what the definition means um, when it says that a physical object represents a physical entity of sorts. So, What's the notion of representation in that respect? So that doesn't necessarily need to uh, lead to an update of the definition, but I think it should be explicated um, in a usage note or accompanying documentation. So I think um, the, uh, the definition works, um, but I also think it needs to be explained by additional material to make sure that users understand um the same thing as those that are that have been part of the work in the in the task group yeah and it's so it's interesting that you say that because we also have in the chat you know this definition includes a physical photograph and a physical drawing of an organism or fossil right um, and I can tell you right now that this is something we um, as collection managers have been struggling with um, uh, these kinds of things, because I feel like for some reason we we seem to be able to make the distinction between a digital image and an object, but a physical photograph and an object, it's it's less clear. And I guess like in the case of a photograph of something, um, is the photograph an actual sample or is it an observation? And, the, and so 
I agree. I feel like there is this fuzzy line and I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Christian? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can uh, chime in here directly because this is something that uh, struck me also um, uh, during our discussion in the um, in the use cases um, symposium on the TEDWI conference. Um, so one one lesson for me from that um, from that discussion was that the term sample, so the English word sample really carries a lot of uh, of different meanings uh, from different um, user groups and 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 groups of practice and um, and it's I think because because this is the case any any technical term and and what to, to, in, in my uh, in my understanding, so what what we're trying to invent here is a technical term that describes uh, that that subsumes certain objects um, in the world and and doesn't subsume others. So whenever the word sample is part of such a technical term, um, there is there is a high risk that 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 users at first glance at least um, will 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 feel a mismatch between their use of the word sample and their professional contexts and um, the use that is intended um, or, or the use of the word sample as in material sample um, as a term as a technical term and um, that can only properly be understood by reading and understanding the definition for that term and um so um i think i think um questions or criticisms um are valid be because um because of course we we want to um we want to include various user communities and if there are constant clashes with how they use certain words in their work then um, this is a constant uh, source, I think, of misunderstandings and problems. Um, and uh, so, I don't know if if the if the general response to um, to to using material sample as a technical term is that there are constant clashes with um, with different communities of practice. Then um, maybe the lesson is to actually use a, um, a term that carries less connotations for the technical term, but still subsumes the same things, that uses the same definition, basically. Um, so at least this is one option, I think, that um, that uh, for me was one lesson from that um, discussion at the TEDWIC conference. Yeah, um, the, the problem I've run into, I think, is that every single word has, somebody has something attached to it, right? So, uh, Yuda. Yeah, I think it's really difficult. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, in Latimer Core, we just don't talk about samples, we talk about objects, which likely has another bag of connotations with it, but you, <clears throat> it might make it easier to talk about human remains. Um, for example, I don't know which um, use cases you had in mind, Christian. Um, also, if I understand it right, like the GBIF data model talks about entities that might be one option or units, um, whatever that is. Um, so that could be possibilities. Um, with regard to the, the um, exchange in the chat, what is a material sample and what is just like, is a photograph one or not? I, I would suggest to make a high level distinction between a material sample and an information artifact. That is something that we had discussed early on in the in the group. And I think that 
makes sense. So like um, have one of the properties um, with a vocabulary that distinguish these two very kind of distinct types. Um, is it material or is it not? Um, and go from there, then a photograph can have, can be a digital representation of a certain part of an organism and you can reuse it. the attributes that you use for a material sample, you also can use for the digital representation. So, um, yeah, I hand over to Marielle. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, I agree with uh, with Christian that uh, the term sample has been confusing in a number of communities. Since I work with genomic resources, obviously, virtually everything that I archive is a sample, but it comes from a whole organism that was removed from nature. And then um, various samples are taken from it, including, you could argue, the, uh, the study skin, the skeletal material that are preserved uh, in the, the collection, say a mammal collection, for example. Um, so everything becomes a sample in, in that way, but it is, it is contrary to the way that that term has been used by many collections. Um, I agree again with Yuta that it may be uh, entity or, or object or a catalog object is what we use um, in my, in the database that I use we, um, in Arctos that we share our, um, our data, our database collaboratively across many different types of collections, including cultural and art collections, where they have many representations of things, many as well as uh, human remains. So the you know, use of a, of you know uh, of terms is sensitive, and you know we need to make sure that uh, we can accommodate all potential uses. So we use the term catalog record, which can be anything from a whole organism to um, a tissue sample uh, and everything in between. But I, but I, so, so perhaps something other than sample is, is warranted here. Um, in the case of the media, that is uh, again, another issue that we're facing. Um, when you have um, a photograph or an art piece that is itself a catalog item uh, or catalog record or an entity, that is different, uh, or is it different from a digital image of that particular object? If it's an image, a digitized image, born digital of a of a whole organism, versus it is an an actual photograph of that organism that is archived in a collection. Uh, one of our arguments has, you know, our discussions has been: if you can put a barcode on it, then it becomes an actual object or part or item. If it is does not have a way to put the barcode on it, then it becomes media. But I'm not really happy with that either. So I don't know what. Uh, I mean, I agree with you to that. The attributes need to be very, the same. You know, the, a, a digital item or a photograph in a drawer will still have similar attributes that need to be captured, regardless of its if its physical nature. So those are two different observations. That, uh, but yes, I agree with both of the things that have been said. John? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, let's go for it. Um, I just wanted to echo the, the perspective that Juta has shared, and that that is the approach that's being followed in the GBF Unified model. There's a clear distinction between material and digital, and there's other things too that are distinguished. And that sample is something that is completely disjoint from the nature of the entity because it's the sample is a relationship to other things another sample and relationships can exist between the material ones and the non-material ones and so on so keeping sample completely out of the term facilitates its use more broadly and that's i think what marielle was saying and something of what christian was saying as well so, and, and every time that we have a discussion, the sample part of the term is the one that really we revolve around and around and around. So dump it, no more sample, it's material. 
and let sampling be an event or something that happens to it or from it or any yeah. other kind of relationship yeah i i like this idea a lot honestly um and if you look at um the latimer core um terms they do have one that's just material um but their definition of it doesn't really uh, match with you know what i'm thinking material sample is trying to do right now um i think it's probably more um well, which is the one that they have that's It's uh, blah, 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 blah. Utah, help me out. Which is the one that would be material sample? Now I have to search for myself. I mean, I guess there's so um, the type of collection term, but to me, that's more of a, a course description. Um, it's not really telling you, um, whether you have material or not, but I know you guys have a term for that. Which I can be. Well, I, I'm <laughs> looking for it. I can't find it so quickly. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah. We'll um, find it. Stan, why don't you go ahead? Okay, um, so I wanted to I, I, I like this this uh, catch or this you know this this notice of the distinction between um, the physical sample or physical object and the photograph, even though it's a physical photograph. So in some sense, I, I, I think that's a worthwhile distinction to make. Um, and I would not equate a physical photograph, even though it represents something. So to some degree, um, I think this representation issue is wh why would why did we throw that in? And this whole business of a sample being a representative of another thing um, is part of um, the sample being used to study or to infer the properties at some point later, uh, you know, through further study of the larger thing the 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 physical entity the natural phenomenon whatever it was um so I, that's why the representation term you know was was incorporated into the definition and then the question is i think is how far how far do we go with that representation and and in um and so the you know you if you wanted to you know study a photograph in some way what you're what you're getting is only a, a two-dimensional representation of light coming off and you're getting the shape or some some uh transformation of the 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 way you know light is reflected or transmitted through something um and it's not that thing itself. So you couldn't determine the molecular composition of the original thing from a photograph, right? So there's the distinction that I think I think is useful. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, how, something that we might want to uh, retain in our definition of a material object or sample, and, and Steve is um yeah so in the same thing with true so i was also thinking of the cases of molds and casts and fossils again you get the shape of something but you don't get the material you know chemical physical composition of that that thing so it's it was not part of the thing it only represents some aspect of it in the, that being the shape um yeah so i think i think that was all i wanted to say i don't know if people find that useful or not but 
I guess my my first um, you know sort of question would be is this distinction between you know having having the actual the sample or the object being composed of the same or parts of the same entity that was sampled is that a critical aspect of our definition do we want to maintain that distinction and i would say yes <laughs> steve well i have for some time maintained that like the the way that we should distinguish between things isn't like necessarily based on some philosophical discussion of it but like what are the sets of properties that we would want to apply to it so it's like a practical definition and so you know it's sort of like the this previous criterion of like can you put a barcode on it if if it's a kind of thing that you need to say what drawer you put it in or what uh you know just what the disposition is of it then it's one kind of thing if it's something that has a file format and a number of bytes or whatever then it's another kind of thing and so dividing the things up in that way seems more relevant to our job which is to describe metadata schemas for people just to describe things you know it, yes a fossil is something that doesn't contain the physical material but people put barcodes on it and they and they have information about like loan loan records and things like that so i i would take a practical approach more than a philosophical approach on it yeah i mean so dusty kind of said the same thing to us last week was um does it you know, when we get into the philosophy of putting barcodes on things or whatever, um, he's like, is it atoms or is it ones and zeros, right? <laughs> like those are the, those are the things we're looking at. And I mean, I think there still will be, there is a weird overlap in the form of a photograph, which to me, the material is the photograph. What it depicts is something else altogether um and in a way turns out to be identification or other things but it's still a physical object that you might go looking for um or want to use in some way so um and i i just feel like our challenge really becomes that some people are seeing the photograph as more important because of the mouse that's in it <laughs> and and they're and that's getting kind of conflated with just I have a photograph um and I'm not sure how to like bridge that gap and make everybody you know happy with the idea of I don't care what's in the photograph it's a photograph and that's all I care about from the standpoint of material, right? What is it? Yuda? So <clears throat> could one thing be both? Um, so if you if it's an historical photograph, um, you would be interested actually, like it would be a print and you would be interested in actually the, the thing that you can hold, help hold in your hands. So in the material object. Um, and on the other hand, this material object will provide you information about something in nature out there. And so it will give you evi evidence. So it would actually be both. Um, it would depict something that is an information artifact. And at the same time, it will be a material sample, I actually, I guess I haven't thought about it this way before, <laughs> but no. you could, I mean, so what, what I think is that you could have several attributes actually attached to it. So it, you could just simply say it's a material object and an information artifact, and then 
go along with the corresponding vocabularies. Yeah, that Christian? doesn't make sense to me. Um, yeah, so actually, I'm not at all concerned about photographs. So in a in a collection of paper photographs, um, of course, uh, according to the definition that we propose, uh, a particular paper photograph is a material sample. And um, so, um, yeah, I think the first point is I cannot stress this enough um, that um, when, when uh, in the context of, of information exchange, exchange standards like Darwin Core, any term is a technical term that needs to be understood by referring to its definition. We, we could call this thing quijibo. And have, if it has the same definition, it still means the same thing. The problem with material sample is that the words material and sample evoke certain expectations, what the meaning is. And of course, this is an important issue with, with using terms from a natural language. And, um, um, and as far as I, can, I recall, the, the, the beginning of the, of, the, um, of the material sample discussion, and, and uh, which led to the formation of the task group, um, was um, an unhappiness with the existing terms, preserved specimen, etc., which seemed not to encompass all those physical items that we care about in collections and in the object history of, of those items that are um, uh, that are maintained in a collection, that are preserved in a collection. And um, uh, so actually at this point of the discussion and at this point of, of, of the tasks that the group that the task group is tasked with, I don't care at all what the what the physical object stands for. I think there are many, many different ways in which we can draw inferences from an artifact in our collection to something else. A few of them have been mentioned. There are fossils, trace fossils, uh, other kinds of fossils, which through an elaborate series of geological transformations and chemical and physical processes, um, lead back to a living organism. There are photographs which, again, by an elaborate series of chemical and physical processes, lead back to some organism that we think we uh, recognize on the photograph. And there are many, many different other different uh, um, links, I think, that can be that can be made up in, in this respect. So I would say at this point of the discussion, don't get carried away about these links. There is a multitude of them, and it's worthwhile perhaps to distinguish certain types of links as those between photographs and living organisms, for example. And um, uh, the, the main point, I think, at the moment uh, with the definition of material sample is the label, because it's misleading to many people, because they think when they think about samples, they think about something else not about what we think about, about samples when we uh, are discussing in the task group. And the second thing is that um, why don't we just say physical object? Because there are clearly physical objects in the world that never get uh, to be part in a uh, collection. The atmosphere, the taiga, North America, they will never be part of a collection because they're simply too big. And so, as far as I recall, so one intention um, uh, behind that notion of representation in the discussion was to, to say, well, not all physical objects can be part of a collection. They need necessarily need to be uh, constrained in size, at least, uh, or you somehow need to be able to get hold of them. Uh, they need to be, they need to have a persistent existence, at least for a short amount of time in which you are able to, to, to get your hands on them, to sample them. And um, uh, 
But after all, maybe this is not so important because as, as far as I understand, these definitions are basically used to illustrate what the terms mean. They are not strictly used as at least this isn't something that I've seen often in the context of Darwin Core, but I'm, I'm a relative newcomer to this. They are not usually used, these definitions, to actually infer that a particular thing is part of a class or is not part of a class um, in terms of necessary or sufficient conditions that the definition puts forward to decide whether a particular item that we have before us falls under that definition or not. So maybe it's so, and therefore, maybe the, uh, the practical approach that was mentioned that basically tries to illustrate what the term um, is intended to encompass um, is actually all we need um, at this moment. Um, and maybe what is not needed is um, extensive philosophical rigor, which is a good thing, I would maintain, um, to, to have an Aristotelian definition that precisely names the necessary or sufficient conditions for one item to fall under this definition or not. Yuda. Um, continuing on this like um, definitions, and I agree, I, I mean, it, over the past uh, week or so, I have been delving into the history of Latimer Core and what has been done in the natural collections descriptions um, way back. And they actually had definitions for all of their terms and uh, examples also in the synthesis task group for uh, collections uh, digitization dashboard, there are examples. And I found that exceedingly helpful for um, deciding on, on attributes for properties and so on. So I think really if we, we are talking about both the terms of the properties and vocabularies, it is always necessary to have uh, definitions. What do you actually mean with a certain word? Because you could approach it from very different um, directions and understand it quite differently. So that is something what I recognized. Um, and I, so far I have been only working with words, but I recognize that I have to add definitions to all of these wonderful vocabulary terms, so attributes. So I, I agree, it's important to have definitions and orient yourself by these definitions. Yeah, I think part of the challenge is, I mean, and we've seen this right here, is that term people have in their brain already what some words mean. Um, and so they don't read the definitions or they decide to ignore them because they know what this term means, right? Um, I, I it's the like the discussion we had about what's the difference between a specimen and a sample. And I feel like nobody in the world can tell me that. But people know what a specimen is and they know what a sample is and they're not the same thing. <laughs> so um, so I, I do agree. I feel like including the word sample in this term causes problems. Um, and, you know, the whole idea that North America can't be in a collection, uh, there's probably somebody somewhere that would disagree with that. Like, just because I can't hold it in my hand doesn't mean it's not in my collection. Um, ask Stephen Wright about all the shells on the beach, right? He keeps his shell collection scattered all over the world. So, um, Maybe we need to go take a step back and think about taking that out of this term and ditching the whole idea of we're describing material samples and instead say um, we're describing material entities 
um, objects, I, I still feel like in a way, well, maybe if we put material and object together, that would work. Um, but I'd be curious to hear what other people feel about just ditching this whole idea of material sample and making a new term. Stan? Um, are you also then suggesting that we sever the, the idea of uh, aligning with the I sample people or the whatever it was that uh, no no because we 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 we're rejecting one of their foundational terms it seems well i mean they already actually that wasn't the name of their term oh. started this conversation <laughs> they changed it to align with what we were doing so um i'm sure they could do that again too if we decide on something else and what did they use they were using, uh, it was just sample type instead of materials. I don't remember what it was before that. Yeah, I think it was just oh, sample time. number, wasn't it? I, it didn't, yeah. Well, it had a, it, they, they changed it from something to material sample type. I don't remember what it was. Maybe Yuta knows. But it was the sampling part was type. still there. Specimen type, that's what it was. And they changed it to material sample type after discussions you know with our group because the the uh, i think is sort of representative of the a larger community that we've been trying to kind of sort of align with is is uh, simon cox you know he's the one who's been bringing up you know the notion that you know from the world that he comes from which is pretty broad mm -hmm. but uh, obviously very geo geoscience focused um you know that the, the and and statistics, I think he also comes from from that representation, you know, or that discipline as well. Um, the whole notion of of sample was is is part of is a critical part of that vocabulary. Maybe it's not Which, the only word, but it it's it was important to them. But I also feel like I mean, what John pointed out is that um, in a way that's like once removed, right? Calling something a sample versus calling something material. Um, you know, what Devil's Tower is a sample of, you know, a, an extinct volcano to some people, um, but you can't put it in a box. You could put a barcode on it, but you probably never find it again. Um, but I, I feel like in some ways we should be starting with the broadest concept possible. Um, and we have kind of narrowed ourselves down to it has to be this physical thing that I can put in a drawer. And in a way, it has to represent something larger. Like well, the, we built that into the definition. But what about all the people who are taking things, consuming them completely, deriving some information from them, but they still need to identify that thing that they. Well, that's fine because it's just going to have a disposition of used up or whatever, right? It existed okay. at some point. I mean, I think we're going to have to get comfortable with that happening. And, and I mean, so, so this, this, you know, this group that we have is very focused on collections, I think. Right. And, you know, that's the discipline we come from. But there are uh, lots and lots of people who come from the world where collections are not really part of it. They think of data sets or whatever. Right. Um, anyways, I, I'm, I'm just, you know, as we broaden out to be larger than our usual community or, or social group, then we're taking on additional concerns and perspectives. Yoda, did you have something else? Um, what? So I, well, now I'm <laughs> so no, I that. that. <laughs> so what I originally wanted to say is that um, basically I think anything that we do will be better than what we have right now. So, um, so I'm coming from um, the use case of GR cycle. And if you look at what kind of data is um, in the database right now for all the terms related to 
material samples and the lot to um, anything that we can do and that we try out will be just much better. And at what point we just have to, we won't, we might not get it right at the first step, but um, it will definitely be progress. So, and I also think that we are, that was the second thing in answer to, was it you, Stan, just right now? Um, I think we are um, already a bit broad. So like, I mean, uh, um, Steve, Stephen from iSamples, he is, I think he comes from, from the paleontological, geological side. Um, I come from likely more the statistical side. So we have kind of like a, um, a broader perspective. So um, what I would, I mean, we, we are raising here the topic if we should, like I thought we had these two terms like finished. Um, and so if you're raising the topic here right now, if you should re rename them, then I should, I think we really should come to a conclusion and really say, okay, we are now going to call them um, material object type. That would be my preference, but I can live with material entity type and, um, and do that and not discuss it forever because um, I would like to move on. Um, I can live with sample, um, but I am also happy to change if that clashes too much with somebody else's, um, like what uh, Mariel said, like what you're doing in Actos. Um, so let's just do it. So uh, Yuda, because I don't have it in front of me, and you maybe don't either, but you might be able to find it faster. Um, in the in the Latimer core object stuff, um, I think it's like object group or something that basically splits between information and material. And what are the terms that you guys have in there for that split? So, um, so the this highest level split is that we have for collections. So we are looking at the collection level, but ob obviously the entities or the objects within a collection will define like the the main characteristic of the collection. Um, so the, the I think the property that the highest level property is um, base type of collection and the terms that we have in there as examples are material sample and information artifact. And so I think what I would align these with the terms from the GBIF data model, which are, um, I got them from the diagram, so I'm John, please correct me. So they are called material entity, digital entity, collection organism. Um, Correct. So that's kind of like the, the terms that are out there. And in Latimer Core, we, we do object. So if that is a question. So, but I mean, specifically there in the examples, the term material sample shows up, right? Like because I edit it there yeah. it from our <laughs> yeah. group. So I mean it's <laughs> we're happy to change that. So that's yeah. that's not coming from somewhere else. Yeah. I mean I think this is also kind of part of the challenge in um what we call things is you know then those whatever term we pick gets used all over the place potentially, or is equal still to things that are used somewhere else that have yet to be changed to match. You, you guys get what I'm saying there? It's, that's kind of random, but you know, if we decided today or tomorrow, whatever to say, no, we're not gonna have material sample, it's gonna be material entity. 
Um, and Latimer Corps was already out there doing its thing with material sample. It makes it hard for newcomers <laughs> to um, match things up. So also something. Ter Teresa, in the new model with, uh, that Ajibif is proposing, um, they use entity in this context, or would we be overlapping with a different use of the term? Um, I mean, John can can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like uh, really in the in the GBIF model, what we are talking about here is material entities, because an entity could be, you know, the mouse with all of its parasites. Um, which is still a material entity, but it's like a broader one. I don't know. John, what are you what what are your thoughts on that? Entity first, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, entity is um, is a class that's very generalized and it's sort of a pragmatic class that allows other things to be related to each other by making them subclasses of an entity. What's clear is that there are material ones and there are non-material ones. And right now there, there's no, there is a class for material entities. There's no class per se for non-material entity, which would be everything that's not material. However, there are some examples of them. Digital entities are one example, and an organism is another example. Within the digital entities, there are also subtypes, such as a sequence, a, gen a genetic sequence is a digital entity. And then there might be others, things like a data set might end up being a digital entity as well. So entity itself is meant to be quite vague and pragmatic and allow you to connect other things together. Um, Given your examples, go back to that physical photograph. That's a material entity, no question, in the GBIF unified model. If you make a digital representation of it, you have a digital entity that's related to the physical one, the one you share on the web. And it has its own characteristics that are digital in nature. And both of them can be related one way or another to the physical material that was of interest as content inside of them. So you can relate, because the entities can be related in whatever ways are needed, you can say very specific things about how the physical photograph is related to the physical specimen and how the digital photograph is related to the physical photograph and so on on and so forth you can be very explicit about all those things and that's one of the beauties of keeping it like i was saying disjunct <clears throat> from the roles that they play being clear about what their nature is so does that help mariel it makes sense to me and i don't see any conflict with the way that we're discussing using it here does anybody else i mean it seems like it would fit with the gbif model Certainly, um, in terms of if, if I have um, an herbarium sheet that has an actual plant and I have a picture of the plant in the wild that was taken along with it, and I have a digital scan of that picture, I would have two material entities and one digital entity all related through different relationships to the same physical object that was removed from nature or sampled from nature. And you'd also have That's how the I organism that they represent. Yes, the organism in nature that it was representing, which may or may not be in a collection. It may still be out there, um, but it still exists as an entity. Yeah, that reflects exactly how we think of it. That would certainly work for what I have to do in managing my collections, which um, include uh, physical samples and representations because I'm dealing with tissues and parasites and sequences and what you just described, all of those, and all of those are derived from entities that may or may not even be represented as 
say, a voucher in, in a museum that may have been just taken from a mark recapture in the wild or, you know, or a zoo animal that was sampled. So all of those things would fit in the context of what I do day to day. James? I don't know if I'm being purposely quiet here or <laughs> if I'm as confused as everybody else. Anyway, I, I'm not against entity simply because uh, in the discussions, you know, sort of related to Dina, but other, other things we've been doing for a long time, we started at entities. We, we had physical entities, just entities as Christian has probably said. And we migrated to material samples simply because the community seemed to be migrating towards material samples and we wanted to be, we felt like it was important to map or, or to have that ability to crisscross. And, you know, there's a big discussion going on in the chat here about, you know, what's more important is, is and, you know, we, I think we have to remember that we're at the level of the standard at the base, the very bottom. And we are the piece that makes the connections work. And what we call stuff, isn't very relevant to many other people, right? Because it's part of implementations. It's in data models. It gets thrown into databases. Names change all over the place. And, and we've had a really hard time, I, I'm going to be honest, uh, in, in my world, trying to keep our collection managers and others away from those terms and saying, look, you know, in the implementation, in DINA, in Arctos, in Specify, you control the labels, you call it what you want so that you understand what you have to put in that field, right? We'll align it underneath. We'll, we'll suggest control vocabularies, give you best practices. But in the end, what we call it an underneath doesn't really matter to you. What matters to us is that it is as uh, mappable across other uses of the same thing. And, and so, you know, John's points are very valid in saying, look, you know, what really matters here is to keep a fairly broad perspective so that it is easy to align these things. So that, that's, I think, where I stand. <laughs> so, I mean, since I've got you uh, listening right now, if, if we change from material sample, is that going to make you crazy? Um, or will you care? Um, you know, how would that affect you and the people you work with? Well, and, and Christian's in this game with me too, but I feel like it's it's the, we can continue to say material sample if we want, because it's a communication tool with the people that we're dealing with. We also can decide, well, that communication tool wasn't working so well, so let's abandon that and call them entities again. And they may feel just as uncomfortable about that or not. But we what we have to keep telling them is, look, you put the labels on these things <laughs> up front. We'll just work in the background and make sure that you can publish your data and it will be as you know standardized as possible to communicate with across different platforms, et cetera. So yeah, I, I don't think Christian can can say too, but I don't think it's the end of our world. I think I we can, can still talk about samples. It's still about samples to me, but that's a different story. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I think we can, um get around this by you know actually expanding not necessarily the definition but the the information that we include in the description or um you know further documentation um because you can include all of these different sort of synonyms that people have been using and explain you know what those you know what the various bits the definitions entity object collection um, you know, it, it could be uh, potentially very extensive, but then, you know, I think it's helpful to for those communities or those people that come to the definition and the description, um, you know, trying to figure it out. It's it's helpful for them to see where they fit. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really critical, if you really want to get down into the details of how we're mapping and what you do consider or not consider to be one of these things is these edge cases so if fossils are supposed to be material samples or you know in this uh, bucket so to speak with all the rest of them you know what about them puts them in and what about them keeps you know potentially keeps them out or you know is that edge case in the same with physical photographs we we can raise these these edge cases and make it clear for people, um, you know, what's in and what's out. 
Christian? No. Can't hear you. <laughs> I basically agree with everything that James said. Um, and uh, that's, <laughs> it's, uh, James, this is a really important point that, and I think it needs to be stressed that right here, we're talking about elements of an information ex exchange standard. And then there is another level where the information exchange standard is used somewhere in the, on the bottom of concrete applications that have users and that have user interfaces. And there you still have uh, a number of nuts and bolts to enhance the user experience. And one of those is to, one of those is to use the labels in the user interface that the users expect that conforms to their usage of certain terms or certain workflows that they employ. And um, of course, I mean, there needs to be an informed and responsible translation between the two. And there's, there's no automatic way to do this. You still need to resort to definitions and um, examples that uh, explicate how certain elements of an information standard ought to be used. Um, but there is this additional level or these additional levels to carry over the information to users in the right way, in the correct way. And so a switch from the label material sample to material entity, for example, which, which I like, entity is abstract, nobody really knows, uh, or uh, I doubt that very many people have an intuitive understanding of what an entity is, so you're forced to read um, the definition or the documentation. So a switch from the label material sample to the label material entity, possibly maintaining the same definition, it's an easy step. And um, um, I think it, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it would, James, it, it wouldn't make, it wouldn't cause problems for, for the work that we're involved in at DINA and, and at our uh, collections and institutions. Um, and um, it would avoid, as, as, as Carlos in the chat points out very nicely, it would avoid perhaps many under problems and understanding with communities of practice which have a certain understanding of the words sample or specimen and if this triggers nomenclatural terminological changes in other places of Darwin core or other information standards as well to to make a switch from sample or specimen to entity or object or item or whatever um, then perhaps this is a welcome development to raise the, um, the, the gap between expectations that people have intuitively when they use certain words on the one side and on the other side, the technicality that the terms have and ought to have in an information exchange, exchange standard. Yoda? So as we seem to be zooming in onto entities, um, and I'm happy with that. Uh, I like the label thing. I think that's important. One question I have, and I don't have enough experience, we are, so mapping seems to be like high on the agenda of a lot of people currently. Um, so, and with Darwin, uh, Darwin Core, with Latimer Core, we, started or Matt Woodburn actually mapped our term, our terms to uh, where they come from, because most of what we do comes from somewhere. And it's actually not so simple. So I was wondering if we use such a really broad concept like entity, are we going to run into problems when it comes to mapping? Um, or does it make it easier to map? Um, so that would be my question. That is kind of like maybe before we decide on on changing to entity. Anybody who has experience? Well, so 
Um, I'll just interject here a little bit because I feel like, um, first of all, material entity or material sample, whatever we wind up calling it, um, is intended to be a class. So you basically are saying whatever I have belongs in this class, correct? Um, so I think in this case, it's not really so much mapping because we're going to ask people to identify things as this class, right? John, you, you go. <laughs> um, my question is the same as what Christian put in the chat, which is what mapping are we talking about? There are two that I can think of. One is mapping between definitions of terms, well, mapping terms to terms um, in a formal way between vocabularies so we know what things are equivalent and what ones are not. And the other is to map actual content into the correct properties and therefore uh, understanding what properties go with what classes. Both of those are important, obviously, but they're very different. Um, they're very different exercises. So which was it that you were interested or is it both? Well, I got myself into like a... <laughs> I actually have no clue what you're talking about. I, I have to say, <laughs> we had, I mean, um, yeah, I need to need to get into that I, I very explain. obviously. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can give an example. Oh, God. <laughs> so in, in Latimer Core, you've got material sample or something like it, right? Mm -hmm. and, okay. and in Darwin Core, we're presumably going to have something. and it, might or might be called material entity for just an example. If it's if we maintain material sample, the mapping presumably would be trivial if the meaning's the same. Material sample in Darwin core is equal to material sample in Latimer core. If the definitions are different, then the mapping isn't like that. Even though their name's exactly the same, the mapping isn't the same. It could be that one is a broader term for the other. So there's that kind of mapping of the semantics of the terms. And if that's the one you were worried about, then yes, that's an exercise that's so far in Teva between Mixus and Darwin Core, where there was a formal mapping of GG, uh, it's not GGBN, never mind the acronym. Uh, GSC, GSC, the GSC terms to the Darwin core ones in using uh, a particular technology to do exactly that, saying this is an exact match to that or a broader term for that, etc. So that's an exercise that has been done once, at least in our community. And, and if it's one that is of interest to do, because a lot of these um, Tadwig proto standards are about to hit public review. And I know the concerns within each one is that we're actually talking about the same things. We need to align the definitions between them. And in fact, use the terms from one or the other, to decide who's, who's the owner of the namespace for the term and use them and use them the same way. That's one exercise. So I have only a little experience with that. I know that it worked very well in, with the mixes group. The experience with the other one has been heavy. We're trying to map data from wherever it's coming from to a given term. That happens to be a problem even with the simplicity of Darwin core. When we start getting more complicated and things can mean things in different places or be terms that belong to two different classes, like scientific name could be part of a taxon or it could be part of an identification, then it becomes more complex for the data publisher to put things in the right place. But that's a different problem altogether. One that is facilitated by having good and consistent definitions wherever the terms get used. Yeah, 
Um, because I think this is part of what, uh, when I started looking at the Latimer core stuff in detail this last week, um, I was suddenly like, oh, wait a minute. I feel like they've already done a lot of this. And if Latimer core becomes a thing, then we need to match up with what they've done. Otherwise, we're just going to cause confusion all over the place. So um, I think it is very challenging. And in some ways, <laughs> this is kind of, this is going to sound crazy, but in some ways, I wish there was just, here's a bunch of terms and their definitions. And then we went and picked from those, like, I'm going to build Latimer core out of these. Um, I'm going to build Darwin core out of these and so on, um, because I'm concerned now that we're going to wind up with essentially equivalent, but maybe slightly different terms, and then mapping between two different cores is going to become a huge headache that nobody has time for. John? Yeah, this is an interesting time. I don't think we've ever run into this quite before. My feeling is that in terms of process, it would behoove us to try to make those alignments while still in task groups, mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting for public commentary where you know how often or how long common conversations can go. And that could end up you know, derailing one or both of the of the task group's goals. So better if we can do it in the smaller groups where people are intimate with what we're talking about before it goes to public commentary, I think. James? Well, totally agree with John. <laughs> this, is a, this is an interesting time where we have, you know, a collision sort of at the same, you know, at the very same time. Um, but uh, I was going to say for Latimer Core, I mean, if I'm looking at this and I'm not as familiar either, but, uh, you know, material sample is a, is a control vocabulary on, under a different term. So that's not a big deal. We just change the name. Uh, and material, well, problematic or not, not sure. But, you know, it, it isn't the same term. Um, but it has risks that in saying material, that that's even more general than a material entity. I don't know. Whereas it's okay. supposed to be. Specific. In a way, it kind of is it's supposed to be the other way around, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But you know, so pushing back Latimer Core is in review. Uh, so you know, the real emergency here really is them. Um, and so I, I would say we need to get our act together and and say something quickly if we feel. I, I don't think material samples an issue. The only thing that might be an issue is material, and that's not actually too much. It's, it's the simple name of a term. So, but what's missing from our side that they have included are these things like preservation, preservation mode, preparation, all things that we were considering would need to be part of the material sample class, right? But they've already done. And, and maybe that's good. And we could just say, yay, done. Mm -hmm. um, but also I feel like potentially that hasn't been looked at in enough detail in the context of Latimer core, but maybe it has, I don't know. There's a pretty broad audience of people in Latimer core. So I would assume that that's been fairly widely looked at. Uh, Yuta, you've been part of this, uh, Deb's gone, but she was too. Well, a lot of these, um, so the history seems to be that um, a lot, a lot of this work has been done in the synthesis um, project um, to towards this, uh, these dash dashboards that they were developing. So I think a lot comes from there. And I mean, obviously, um, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Deb would know much better about the history. I mean, there's the Latimer Core Task Group has this very, very long 14 years of history um, that has not been completely discontinuous. So I think there's some basis to it. Um, Christian? 
now. Um, so if Latimer core has convincing concepts, um, terms and definitions for something that, that is clearly related to material samples, material entities, then by all means, let's reuse it. And um, um, and I think it's 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 always worthwhile to broaden the view um, there. Um, so to to just give you one example, so there's there has over the last decade, there has been a lot of worthwhile work in the open biomedical ontologies. That's still like it's it, it's a different technology stack, but the conceptual work I think is something that the biodiversity community should aspire to connect to especially because there are more and more analytical techniques which really go across um, uh, biodiversity science, uh, collection science on the one hand and uh, life science um, methodology on the other hand. So, um, so let's reuse things that are already there and that are convincing and that, that, um, that cover uh, the use cases at hand. I also would like to... Uh, quickly remark on something that I believe John said earlier. So, I mean, if we go on and say, hey, the generic class that we want to address is material entity, and that's the label that we that we go with, or material object or whatever, then of course there's still a place for material sample. Um, and I agree that the term sample um, evokes certain expectations as how to this material object has been obtained or that it stands in a relation to something else that got sampled. And um, so um, having material entity as, a, uh, as an umbrella class, as a generic class to, um, to um, cover a variety of use cases that Mario also um, alluded to earlier um, doesn't, of course, exclude the use of the term material sample um, as what per probably would be a subclass of material entity. And uh, we'll have to see whether we can come up with a um, good definition that covers that intuition that something else got sampled somehow by the material sample. but this probably would be um, would be would be the int intuition that somehow would need to get formalized by defining um, a class labeled with material sample. Yeah, um, I I think you know one of the the things that struck me when I was talking to the Latimer Core group last week is, you know, for me, when I look at some of the things that they have in collection description, so it was like base type of collection um, or object group or whatever. And, you know, my gut reaction is like, well, that should just roll up from the bottom, right? I either have a bunch of material or I have a bunch of observations or whatever. And that's how you get to a group or a, you know, basic description. Um, and so I guess part of me is also thinking about people who are managing these collections that are going to be described and how are they going to get to those things, right? In some cases, it's easy. I got a bunch of fossils, so boom, I have a fossil collection, yay. But in some cases, it's not so easy. You have a whole bunch of different things and, and how do you decide which one's most prevalent or what am I really keeping track of here? Or do you have to decide? And does that mean that everything in your collection needs to carry one of these labels so that you can get, you know, to the kind of meta description? So I think that's the, the thing that kind of bothered me in a way, but I guess thinking about it from the opposite direction, if I just assume that everything physical is a material sample, then, you know, my base type of collection is material, like, or whatever they choose to put in their vocabulary. So 
I don't know. I, I, it sometimes becomes difficult to tease apart thinking about these terms as individual descriptors and how they're going to get used in some of these, you know, kind of classification property things like Latimer core or Darwin core or whatever. Um, and I think that's where potentially we run into trouble. But um, we're coming up on our time here. And I do think, you know, after talking with the Latimer Corps people, what my task group really needs to do is look at the terms that they have and consider those. Um, because while eye samples could still be useful for controlled vocabularies for potentially some of these terms, I think we need to think about what's happening right now in the Tadwig sphere and make sure that we're aligning with that more importantly. So does everybody kind of agree with that assessment? Yeah, okay. Um, so I think, you know, I still have our monthly meetings on the calendar. Uh, I believe it's week next week or week after next, I don't remember. Um, but I think this is what I want to focus on. Um, we can talk about using something other than material sample, although in the grand scheme of things, I'm not sure that will make a huge difference as long as we have good definitions. Um, but I'm open to changing that if it's going to make it easier for the world to read the definition. Um, but I, I, we really need a close look at what is Latimer Core putting down uh, for describing a collection and making sure that we can, A, use those terms and, uh, and hopefully align with them uh, before that thing goes out for public review, which I don't know when that's supposed to be. I, I don't know what the timing for all these things are. That's up to Ben Norton. He's the review manager. So he's basically going to take the result of the expert reviews, which are going on right now. And he'll, uh, I don't know if he has to come to the executive, but he'll make some recommendation to the executive as to whether it's ready to go to public comment or not. Yeah, and, and it could take several weeks. I mean, you know, it's often uh, difficult to get reviewers to respond. Uh, a month is probably optimistic. Um, I don't know when they went, when the requests went out, but at, and especially if the if the you know if there's a lot of documentation and and you know material to review, it's going to take take those folks some time. Which is um, a lot. <laughs> My understanding is that it's actually turned into a somewhat iterative, more iterative process than it has in the past. I mean, in the past, the, the uh, draft has gone out for review and the reviewers review it and often anonymously and then they send back a report. In this case, neither of the reviewers are anonymous and I think they're actually you know, like meeting with the task group to talk about things. And so, I mean, you could ask Ben about this, how he's, but the process is, like I say, more, more iterative and the reviewers are quite engaged with the task group itself more so than in past reviews. And so my impression is it's not going particularly quickly because of that, as opposed to like, if you just had the standard review where the review manager says, you got two weeks, send us a paper with some comments in it. Well, but so talk there's to time. Ben, he would know. There's, there's time. <laughs> and I, I think it's, they, they would appreciate, I'm sure, uh, getting feedback from this group and, and others. Yeah, I would actually so it recommend- I would recommend talking to Ben. I mean, I think the goal in the, the whole review process is to get things that will sail through the public comment period without blowing up. That's the last thing anybody wants. And so it's in everybody's interest to have things as clean and as aligned as possible before it gets to that stage, because like public reviews are like cat herding. 
Yeah, so we have been ta um, meeting with them for maybe half a dozen times. And our next meeting is on the 17th, which would be the day after our material sample group meeting. Um, and after that, I, I don't know. So, but it is iterative and on, on both sides, so. Yeah, and so, I mean, Yuda, from my perspective, um, the more we can, you know, coordinate. And if, if I can come to that meeting on the 17th, even if I just listen, um, and maybe I would have something to say from our meeting the day before. Um, but I think that would be helpful and potentially could, you know, shorten up the time that we have some kind of material proposal. Um, because if you guys have already done the work and we feel like these terms you have are useful and match with what we're thinking, um, it seems like I would prefer to just be like, yay, thanks for doing that, <laughs> you know? Um, so the more that we can coordinate with each other, I think the better, um, also, it has been impossible for me to monitor the chat and listen. So I know there's been things in the chat that I haven't addressed, um, but I plan to go back and read it. So, um, you know, if there's some something that I really missed or that's in the chat that somebody thinks we're really missing out on, um, you know, I would appreciate either stick something in the in the shared Google Doc or email me uh, or something so that I don't just skim over something that somebody thinks is super important. But you're going to save the, the chat to that doc, right? Yeah, that's my plan. The chat, the chat will get should get saved along with the meeting recording. And so I should be able to download that for you. That would be fantastic. Um, and, you know, thank you all for being here today. It's really good to have, I feel like I've gotten some outsider perspective from just the, you know, task group people that I'm used to talking with. And that's awesome. So I really appreciate you guys coming. And, um, you know, if you want to attend our regular meetings, um, they're on the 16th. Uh, and I can only tell you my time, which is 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And that's Mountain Standard Time. Um, but feel free to email me if you want to get the meeting link, um, or just use the contact on our Tadwig page. And, um, I would love to have anybody who's interested participate. So, so, um, we've gone a little bit over. I really appreciate y'all's time and I hope that you all have a great day or evening. <laughs> Thanks, Teresa. Uh-huh. Thanks a lot. Thanks.